physiology and biology and so on, uh, wove together these arguments from these various fields into a very, very compelling story of how the theory of biological evolution had no support of any sort, uh, was being promoted uh, mainly as a part of an atheistic agenda, and that Christians should uh, flee it, and if at all possible, fight against it. Uh, so I was very enthusiastic about this, and, and this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a crusader in this uh, noble cause rescuing uh, creation from these evil uh, evolutionists. Uh, Morris penned a whole host of books, uh, all of them in this general area of apologetics, uh, trying to establish that a biblically-based worldview was adequate in every field, in history, uh, in science, uh, in ethics and theology, morality and so on, that everything should be derived uh, from the scriptures, and if things didn't agree with the Bible, then there was something wrong with those things. Uh, so my plan as a young person was to uh, go to uh, San Diego and study at uh, Christian Heritage College, which was newly started with, by Henry Morris and Tim LaHaye, and then eventually work at the Institute for uh, Creation Research as one of these noble warriors who would debate uh, the evolutionists uh, in major universities and uh, help help the cause of Christ uh, in this way. So this was how I envisioned my educational goals as a young man uh, getting ready to head off to college. The creationist worldview, which I had as a young man, age 18, would be, I think, very similar to uh, the creationism that many people still uh, come to college with today. Uh, the belief is that uh, creation is something which is being suppressed by the scientific community because they are atheists. And as atheists, they need to prop up their worldview. And so they develop this theory that rules God out. Uh, this is uh, Richard Dawkins uh, here. You can see little tiny horns coming out the back of his head there. Uh, since he, he's clearly in the service of, uh, of, of Satan uh, there. There is no evidence for this theory that they have to make up everything, they have to distort things, they uh, select data which supports their viewpoint and suppress the greater amount of data which uh, does not support uh, the theory of evolution. Uh, evolution leads to uh, moral anarchy. Uh, there have been a whole library of books with theses more or less like this one that evolution is responsible for and then you can make a long list uh, William Jennings Bryan thought evolution was responsible for the First World War. Uh, Richard Weichart thinks it was responsible for the Holocaust. Uh, Philip Johnson has actually claimed it's responsible for cross-dressing. I mean, you name it, you can find some uh, connection between everything that's wrong in the world uh, and evolution. Uh, so, of course, we should want to dismantle uh, such an uh, untoward theory with all of these negative uh, influences. Uh, it is, of course, completely incompatible with the Bible, and Henry Morris wrote a, a full-length commentary on the book of Genesis in which he unfolds in a scientific way the meaning of all of those uh, creation stories and so on, uh, showing that at every turn there is simply no way that one can bring evolution uh, together with the scriptures. And if we look at flood geology properly, if we understand that Noah's flood was global, worldwide, not tranquil, uh, and happened more or less as it says in the Bible, uh, we can see that all the fossils were laid down at this time, and other upheavals took place, the mountains appeared after the flood, not before, and so on. Uh, and so if we work all of this out with flood geology, we can see that the Bible actually anticipates uh, almost all of modern science. So this is kind of the standard package, still is uh, today, of what we call scientific creationism. These are the key ideas, and you can find them on uh, Ken Ham's website, Answers in Genesis, or the Institute for Creation Research, uh, Ken Hovind and Carl Bau, and any of these other uh, leaders of contemporary creationism. So with these ideas uh, inspiring me, uh, I headed off uh, to Boston, a long day's drive from uh, Royal New Brunswick, uh, to enroll at Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, to study science. Uh, I did not go to the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego because it was really, really far away, and I found it uh, hard to uh, be simply uh, 400 miles from my home. I couldn't imagine going to the other corner of the continent, uh, plus the Boston Red Sox uh, lived there, uh, and I kind of thought that would be fun to live next door to the Boston Red Sox. So August of 1975, I left the uh, rural New Brunswick uh, and headed off for 
cosmopolitan Boston uh, to become a physicist. While I was there, uh, because Eastern Nazarene is a liberal arts college with a curriculum very much like uh, Calvin College that uh, uh, forces students to engage the broad spread of knowledge and not merely uh, what's relevant to their discipline. I studied uh, philosophy and Bible and history, uh, as well as a lot of science and math. And I found that on all fronts, my creationism was continually challenged. That uh, It seemed like every single course that I took uh, gave me some pause about the worldview that I was trying to maintain. My Bible instructor uh, made it crystal clear that Genesis was not a science text and reading these modern scientific ideas into the uh, early verses of the Bible just made absolutely no sense. Uh, that Genesis, furthermore, wasn't even a history text and it wasn't even appropriate to try to construct a history uh, by adding up the begats and so on there. That Genesis had a theological message, uh, but not a message that made sense if, it's, if interpreted historically or scientifically. I gradually came to discover that there were indeed mountains of evidence for the theory of evolution, uh, that the books which I had been reading were largely written by people who were hostile to evolution. Uh, once I began to uh, study science uh, per se, I discovered that there are a great many evidences that I just was unaware of, and I began to realize that I couldn't simply dismiss the theory of evolution. And I also discovered, to my great surprise, and this was a f reflection of the sheltered upbringing that I'd had, that these particular views about creation were not really the central ideas that the Christian church has always held. That there were very, very important thinkers throughout the history of the church that did not hold these views. That even when the fundamentalist movement started at the beginning of the 20th century, that this was not on the front burner for the people that were involved in that movement. Uh, and in fact, that there were many conservative, Bible-believing evangelicals who did not understand that uh, we have to be young earth creationists if we want to be Christians. So all of these things gave me pause. And in particular, the more I learned about uh, the history of the earth, the more the idea that all of the surface features of the earth were somehow created by Noah's flood uh, seemed implausible to me. Now, this of course meant that this book, which had been so much at the foundation of my uh, faith, uh, now had to be set aside, and I had to wrestle in a real way with the ideas of Charles Darwin. Now, a part of the training of the fundamentalist is this slippery slope argument, that as soon as you take one step away from that biblical literalism, uh, you immediately start down a very untoward staircase, uh, pictured here uh, in a book now almost 100 years old. William Jennings Bryan reproduced this uh, cartoon here. So you can see up here we have a Christian uh, who starts up here, but then he steps off of the step that says the Bible uh, is infallible, it begins to think about uh, the possibility that maybe the Bible doesn't have all of its scientific details completely accurate. Uh, man is not made in God's image. We leave behind miracles of virgin birth. We leave behind God. And eventually we end up down here at the bottom of these stairs uh, as atheists. So we go down these stairs, slowly losing our faith, and surprisingly, looking ever more Jewish as we go, for some strange reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on this slope. I leave Henry Morris behind. I start down. Uh, and I know that at the bottom, I will have to deal with Charles Darwin. Now, struggling with Darwin has been a major problem for millions of Americans uh, for almost two centuries now. Daniel Dennett has captured, I think, the essence of why we have to struggle with Darwin in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Uh, Daniel Dennett is a spokesperson for the New Atheism, so he has an agenda, uh, as he writes. But he's coined this very interesting metaphor for Darwinism, which he calls a universal acid. So this universal acid, says Dennett, will eat through traditional ideas. It will dissolve them away, and it will leave in its wake a revolutionized worldview. Well, I think this idea of Darwin as a sort of acid is actually 
very suggestive because uh, for me at least, as evolution began to kind of creep into my Christian faith, it did appear to me that it was dissolving a few 